and I w I'll say you don't need an introduction because I don't have time to give you one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, introduce yourself. Great. Everybody knows me, of course. Hi, I'm Jesse Major. It's fun to be here. Um, and yeah, I guess I'm a good first talk. It's actually what I've prepared is sort of halfway between my own lab interests and I think the kinds of things you all think about. Uh, just as really brief introduction on me, I've spent most of my career, you can't see that point over there, focusing on these early little things here to understand that complete mouse on the end, right? So these are embryos really during pre-implantation and gastrulation stages. And that's what, what we work on quite extensively in a few different ways. What's nice about giving this talk is I certainly don't need to introduce this data to you all because it came from you, right? So there are two snapshots from Steve and from Henrik, uh, just again pointing out the uh, high percentage of lethality you all find, 24% roughly, and of those, about 57% are in this earliest category, so pre-9.5. And I was thinking about this last night, and actually that means there's 13.5% of all genes, right, are in this category, and I don't know, maybe you guys know, is that the biggest sort of category of phenotype? Sort of, so good for me, right? Keep me in business, that's awesome. <clears throat> um, so this award, really, we developed a sort of what we call a streamlined assessment of these early lethal phenotypes. And if many of you were here three years ago when I shared our strategy as well, it hasn't really changed because it's working quite well. And so we import heterozygous mice once the centers tell us about some early alleles. Um, we establish small colonies and we start our analysis at day 7.5 and we simply ask, can we find the mutant? And if so, what does it look like? Sometimes we can find them. Uh, and they look normal, and we'll look a day or two later, eight and a half, nine and a half, two different types of analyses. If often we will find them, and they're clearly abnormal, so then we do analysis at 7.5 and 6.5, and as you'll see, the other large group that we get is that we cannot find them at 7.5, so we back up, and we flush uteri, and we ask, can we find them at day 3.5? And again, what do they look like? What kind of analysis can we do there? <clears throat> So here's my Hollywood Squares version of our lines, right? It's progressed quite a bit since three years ago. It's just a seven and a half dissection from each of the lines we're working with. Obviously, I don't expect you to get anything from that, but to me, it's fun to look at this way, growing some nice wallpaper. Right? Um, we're up to about 114 lines that we've analyzed in this way. Uh, it, it's been sort of steady, uh, strategy for the last four and a half years. We've got another half year left to go on this award. Actually, yesterday, my renewal landed somewhere nearby here at NIH, so fingers crossed, we'll keep doing this work. And um, what I thought I'd do today is sort of show you, whoops, show you the kind of data we're producing for each line that we're actually getting back to IMCC and some other databases. And then I'll tell you a few short stories of phenotypes we're working on in detail. Uh, and then I'll end with some just thoughts about this whole collection and what we can learn looking across all these lines. So here's an example of a gastrulation stage phenotype. It's sort of a composite data set. Uh, you can see on the left a whole mount image of a littermate and the mutant down below. Uh, I'm showing you uh, <coughs> immunofluorescence after section and embedding for a few different lineage markers along with H and E. And we've developed the strategy to do multiple rounds of IF and then h &E on the same slides. So we get a lot of data out of the same embryos. That's just what's shown here. Um, we're also providing RT-PCR expression data. You can't probably read the, the labels there, but they're just stages during embryogenesis. And when available, about 30% of our lines have a LACSI reporter. So we're also giving back this LACSI expression. And so this is the sort of data set we're compiling for each line at gastrulation. If we can't find them there again, and this other large set we have, are, uh, we can find at three and a half. So here's a nice mutant gene POLD2, uh, a nice mutant blastus, looks perfectly normal. So when we find those, we do these outgrowth assays, so we can grow them for a few days in culture, and ask, can they make a typical outgrowth here with an inner cell mass and trophectoderm growing on the plate? Clearly, you can see this mutant doesn't quite do that basically just shrivels up and dies. Nonetheless, we do these assays, uh, and again, we're providing all of this data for each of these lines. I'm happy to say, uh, oops, as you heard from Henrik yesterday, there are now links up on IMPC. We're gonna tweak that in different ways as well. I've also been in touch with MGI uh, 
Kent and the UCD crew and um, Gene Cards as well are going to provide links to our own website where we're starting to host this just to get this data out to the community. And that was really part of my original proposal and the goal of uh, looking at these alleles that uh, are sort of getting left behind. <clears throat> so that's the, the baseline data we're providing on every line. So as I said, I'll take you through a few short stories and then think about some uh, larger ideas. We find a few, only 4% of our lines, actually make it through gastrulation um, and their orga organogenesis defects. We published a couple of these. I'm not going to tell you about those today. Uh, I'll tell you one story we're developing from this group. So 49% of our lines, and this is the biggest group we get, we call uh, gastrulation failures. And I'll show you what those look like. And I'll tell you about this sort of family that we're working on. They are mito mito mitochondrial ribosomal proteins, or MRPs. And we have a disproportionately high number of these in our set. But again, we didn't select the genes, so I'm not sure how that came about. Maybe one of you has an idea. I'm going to show you some data on these five lines. The names are here, MRPL3, 22, 40, 44, S18C, and S22. Some are LAC-Z containing, and some are um, endonuclease mediated. You're all familiar with these snapshots. What's interesting about them for us also is they all have pretty much Pretty much all of them have heterozygous phenotypes as well that came out of uh, your groups. Um, and they also pretty much all have uh, human disease associations as well. So it adds some uh, relevance and significance. And just as a reminder, um, these are all genes in the nucleus that are transcribed and translated and then uh, imported into the mitochondria where they function as part of this mitoribosome, which is responsible for translation of the mitochondrial encoded genome. Right? And there's really two subunits of this mitoribosome, the large and the small, hence the MRPL and the MRPS. And there's about 70 total of these genes. So what do the knockouts look like? Well, here's a litter mate for each one above, uh, the homozygous mutant below. And so these dissections are at 7.5, uh, where typical embryos have a pretty expanded primitive streak, a node, early head folds, different morphological features, which are all absent in each of these mutants. Hopefully you can see they've formed a really nice pristine egg cylinder, and they're really just sitting there. Right? Um, and I'll show you some more analysis in a minute. And it's pretty very consistent phenotype, certainly with all five of these. And in this large category in general, this is what we find. So we've done a bunch of expression analysis. I won't talk you through all the details, just to say that most of these genes are pretty ubiquitously expressed. We were kind of imagining we might see some tissue-specific or temporal-specific expression, uh, which could explain why they each have a similar phenotype. Uh, we were imagining in this big family there'd be some redundancy, but we actually think there's not. We're starting to look more carefully at the amino acid sequences as well, and there's really not a lot of um, functional redundancy, we think. So widespread expression by RT in embryos and adults. Um, this is true both either with the LAC-Z reporters or when we do in C2s. There is some embryonic specific expression versus uh, absence in the extraembryonic. You can see down here in S22. Um, but for the most part, they're very widely expressed. So if we perform our standard immunofluorescence assays, it's a little hard to see. Um, but again, these are the same sections with multiple rounds of IF. Uh, there's a litter mate on the top, and then each mutant below in a row of four images. And what I'm showing you here is first, all the way on the left of each set is T, and I think that's the hardest to see. This is brachyuri, which marks cells of the primitive streak, which the litter mate, I think you probably cannot see it, has nice nuclear T staining in all the cells of the streak. And all of the mutants have absolutely zero T positive cells, indicating that gastrulation really has not started. We've also marked them here with OCT4, which, as you probably know, is in the epiblast at pre-streak stages. And that's really what we're seeing, is that in each of the mutants, they have really nice OCT4 signal, indicating that the epiblast cells are pretty normal, and they're really just hanging out, not much going on. <clears throat> we also look at proliferation and cell death with different IF markers. Uh, PH3 on the left side in white indicates that there are still some dividing cells in these mutants. Um, and we see actually very little cell death, either with P53 or active caspase. Okay. So just further indicating that, yeah, they're just hanging out. Again, this is 
two days after, we think these embryos have stopped growing. So why are they just sitting there? What's going on? And we want to really understand, sort of hopefully mechanistically, what's happening in these null cells. So we started to ask about the mitochondria, of course. Are they all there? Right? Are we losing mitochondria? One way we've looked at this um, is by measuring the amount of mitochondrial DNA relative to the amount of genomic DNA. And it's a little sort of busy graph, but each line is shown separately with litter mates, both wild type and hets, on the left, and then mutants on the right for each of these knockouts, and then a composite of all of them. Long story short, there's really no change in the ratio of mitochondrial DNA to genomic DNA. Conclusion, the mitochondria are still there in the mutant cells, and we see this by IF as well in different ways. <clears throat> but what do they actually look like? So here's some EM showing controls on the left, and then four of the different mutants, oops, four of the different mutants here on the right. And hopefully you can appreciate, while the wild types have these pretty dense mitochondria with lots of inner crystal layers, in each of the mutants we see very abnormal <coughs> mitochondrial morphology with really these big holes in mitochondria. This has been documented before, mostly in cell lines, as um, some very, indicating very significant mitochondrial uh, misfunction or not functioning at all. Nice mood lighting. Thank you, Nathan. Um, so morphology are there. They don't look very well. Are they producing any ATP, which is really uh, what they're meant to do? Uh, my student devised a way to take one of these cell-based assays and basically we drop a whole live embryo, one into each tube, and the assay works just great, even though there's pretty small cell numbers. And so we're able to get a ratio of ADP to ATP, and that's what I'm showing you here in this similarly laid out graph. And hopefully what you'll see along with me is that in each case, the mutants have a higher ratio, quite significantly higher ratio of ADP to ATP, telling us that there's really hardly any ATP in these cells. Okay, so mitochondria are there, they look terrible, and they're not performing well. Maybe not so surprising. So it's giving us some hints into maybe what's going on and why these embryos are so nice and pristine. Um, and we think it's partly because uh, when you have dysfunctional mitochondria, often what will happen is you'll get elevated cytochrome C levels, which can activate different cell death pathways, including caspase. Right? But this process is ATP dependent, leading to apoptosis. But I just showed you we have no ATP. So oddly, these cells are really should be dying, but they're not. And that's why they're in such good shape when we dissect them, and we don't just find little knots of dead tissue. So we're trying to devise some experiments to get at that and try and maybe rescue this phenotype by adding ATP back, either in culture or in vivo, to see if we can rescue primitive streak formation, which would be a long shot. But my guess is we're going to add ATP, and we're really going to rescue cell death, if that makes sense. So we're imagining we'll add ATP, then they'll start to die, and then we'll know really that's why these embryos are surviving as long as they are. <coughs> so that's where this story's at. We're going to develop it a bit more. Um, look for that in the near future, hopefully, to come out. As I said, we, that's our largest group of mutants, is this gast gastrulation failures. And the other large group that we find are those that cannot be found 7.5, so we back up, and we find that we can collect them at day three and a half, and these are simply termed implantation failures. Right? So here's a typical litter. It's a rather large one. Uh, nice blastus morphology, right? And I've masked their identity, so we can play a little guessing game. Right? So who can spot the mutants? Right? This is a hep by hep cross for this gene med 20. Anybody see any mutants up there? Cat left, I think, right? She would, she would see them. If you're like me, you would say, oh, look, these on the bottom here, those are the mutants, obviously. Not so. Right? So those three are a wild type, a het, and a het. Even though they should be blastus, they're not. There's a different issue, which if I have time, I'll address at the end about this background of mouse. Right? But here's a mutant uh, here. Here's a mutant here and here. They look perfectly normal. Right? So I think myself or any other embryologist will be pretty hard pressed to look at these and see anything wrong. But we know they're not implanting because we can't find them at seven and a half and they're not empty decidua either. So they're really not having a decidual reaction at all. So what happens uh, when uh, Wei Kui here in my lab took these uh, embryos, did our standard outgrowth assays. Here you can see a wild type, a het, and a mutant. 
Right? In this case, these MED20 homozygous mutants are actually failing to hatch from the zona pellucida. So you can't quite see it up, probably on the screen, but it's still enclosed in the zona. The cells aren't quite dead, but it's not hatching. So obviously if it can't hatch, it's not going to implant. When we do some um, molecular analysis of linear specification, so here's the first linear decision, which really segregates <coughs> inner cell mass and trophectoderm. We're marking it with OCT4 and CDX2. This is a wild type, whoops, a wild type, a HET, and a mutant down below. The first decision seems totally fine, right? Nice OCT4 localization, all CDX2 positive cells on the outside, and no cell death going on here either. If we look at this second decision, same uh, layout of embryos, where we're now segregating primitive endoderm and epiblast. We can mark the primitive endoderm with SOX17 and the epiblast with nanog in red. And hopefully you can appreciate SOX17 looks fine, but in the mutant we have nanog widely expressed where it should not be, indicating there's really defective uh, trophectoderm specification going on in these homozygous mutants. It's a little surprising to have this lineage specific effect uh, because MED20 is expressed everywhere, mediator complex, presumably is ubiquitous and acts everywhere. I'm guessing you're all familiar with that. So we've taken this analysis a bit further. I won't tell you so much about it. You can read about it in this recent publication if you want. So this is the type of analysis we're doing on many of these pre-implantation lines and finding very similar stories where the blasts look quite good, but they fail to implant, and they all do have some kind of molecular defects that we can identify. <clears throat> So if, you had, if you've had enough coffee this morning, you realize we're not quite at 100% yet. Right? So there's a couple other stages of, that we find that I haven't introduced yet. And we'll switch gears and I'll just show you in a more sort of pie chart format. Where we have really only a very few that have early cleavage stage arrests. Uh, just a couple real early ones. A handful that make morula but don't compact. Um, we think this is probably low in numbers because most of these genes are maternally expressed as well, and they probably make it through this early period with the maternal loading. I did tell you about this next group, um, that we find nice blasts, but they fail in outgrowth assays. And we've documented both defects in the inner cell mass and the trophectoderm that lead to this failure. We have equal numbers of mutants where we find nice blasts, and they make a perfectly normal outgrowth. Right, those are a little harder to explain why we can't find those at 7.5. But again, when we look, and we've looked at about half of them, we do indeed find molecular defects in one or both lineages, which we think explains why in vivo they can't perform normally, but in vitro assays they actually look okay. There's just a couple that um, implant but don't form an egg cylinder. This was also another surprise. I thought this would be a large category where they didn't plant, we'd see the decidua, but you'd have basically a dying embryo, but we really only have two of those. And the biggest category is this gastrulation failure, right? where we have 49% of our homozygous mutant embryos just stalled at this pre-gastrulation stage. <coughs> and this is a wide variety of gene function. It's not all uh, mitochondrial related genes. And as I said at the beginning, there's a handful that make it through that we've also been characterizing. <coughs> So that's sort of the frequency of our early lethal phenotypes. We can think about this in a few different ways. That's the wrong direction, sorry. <clears throat> and we can start to do different things. We can line them up. So here's a handful of these gastrulation failures. You can see they're all roughly similar size. There are some differences, certainly. Um, and again, these are all different gene functions. And at first, we started doing a lot of cell counting to see if there's some threshold of cell number. And we quickly realized uh, there were issues with sort of the validity of counting cells, but that measuring the size in these embryonic stages anyway is a really good surrogate for cell number. And so we've done all kinds of measurements. I'll just show you one. Um, this B from the distal tip to the boundary of the ectoplacental cone. And if we plot out normal embryos, I'm showing you pre-streak all the way on the left, 6.0, mid-streak, 6.5, and then 7.5 node stage embryos, you can see this nice growth of the embryo. If we add to this graph each of our different mutant lines, I'm showing you them separately in sort of vertical groups, you can appreciate that they all are roughly the same size. That they're all really stalling before the point at which you normally get to when gastrulation starts. And we think this is really supporting this notion um, from Patrick Tam and others that there is some critical cell number that you need to reach in order to start gastrulating. 
and we're trying to devise experiments using some of these mutants to try and get at that question, is that really true? A little tricky thing to sort out, but we have some ideas about how to get there. This is actually not true of the earlier set. So these ones where the mutants make blasts but fail to implant, they're all the same size as normal ones. So here's wild types uh, of various stages of blasts on the left, and here's all the mutants in a similar type analysis. No overall size defect or cell number defect. We actually have good cell number counting here because it's easier to do. And in general, these mutants don't have reduction in cell number. But as I indicated, they clearly have lineage defects in molecular specification. So we think that's really driving these early failures. We can look at our data in a slightly different way. So answering the question that I think was up on one of the earlier slides, will we see a widespread, an even spread of phenotypes, or are there specific developmental constraints? I think it's not that surprising, but our data is clearly showing that indeed there are these two major bottlenecks of phenotypes, right? Implantation and gastrulation, which I think if I had asked you all before I showed this, we would have said the same thing. But to my knowledge, this is the first time where we have this big collection of mutants on the same genetic background made largely by the same people in the same ways where we can really uh, confidently state that's the case. We also think our data is telling us that this early failure is due to molecular misregulation in some way, and the later failure really, really ties back into cell cycle. And we think all these mutants somehow will tie into proliferation defects or cell cycle defects, and they're just stalling and not continuing in development. As you all know, there's a million ways to take gene sets and do different types of analysis. Um, what's nice, I think we're reaching a threshold by which this is useful for our gene sets as well. So if I take all of our gastrulation phenotypes and I feed them into a gene regulatory network, here's the largest node I get out of there. And what I've put on the right side, or on your right side, are all the genes in this node that are not in our collection. And then I've color coded them. Red that have been published as early lethals also. Green that are viable and black that are no data. And it's pretty good. We could almost predict, and most of these genes in this node indeed are, do have an early lethal phenotype. This is even uh, more accurate for our earlier set. And I won't show you that slide, but the largest node there, we get 100% accuracy where we could also predict almost which genes will have this early phenotype. So as we increase our numbers of actual data, I think this will become more powerful. <clears throat> so I'll just end by admitting that I really love doing this work, and I've done a uh, majority of the dissections myself, which keeps me in the lab, and it's really fun. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the next few years and really making some really good uh, Where's Waldo type examples here. And uh, I'll just thank the people involved. Uh, here's my lab members, uh, my main collaborators, and of course, you all for producing the mice and NIH for letting me do the work. Happy to take some questions. Thanks. <clears throat> Yeah, Terry. That's a, that's a tour de force, Jesse. Are, are you, are you going to put this into one publication, this whole story? So, yes, we're just starting to put that together. Okay. Um, and yeah, I got lots of ideas actually yesterday chatting with a few people about how to enhance this story, uh, thinking about so, human stuff and a whole bunch of other ideas. And that was going to be my second question. Have you, have you looked, um, uh, and I know I've, I've tried to do this and it's difficult. Have you looked at fertility panels um, and, and, of course, childhood development diseases? Is there overlap? So, with so a few years I thought I found someone who could do that for me because mm -hmm. you're right, it's very challenging and mm -hmm. I, I don't have any good data there. Just, you know, okay. a few here and there that there are mutants known, but not really. Cool. Well, keep in touch as the paper goes along because we'd love to help you promote it because that's a really Really nice story. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, Jesse, just fantastic. Um, Thanks. Can you tell me about the fidelity of the outgrowth assay? I mean, how reliable is it if you, you know, if you're looking at a group like you showed us, you know, you're blinded, you look at a group of E3.5, mm -hmm. some, some look normally at their mutants, right? and you take those to the outgrowth assay, how, how well can you rely on that assay to be absolutely definitive? Um, we've, we've done probably thousands. So before this project, I did an RNAi screen using that assay as well. So in our hands, we find it really quite reliable. And there's maybe 5% of the time the wild types will fail, not very high. And so it's a little bit of a numbers game. But again, we're genotyping each one after. So even though we might have some wild type or heterozygous failures, what we ask is we look at all the mutants and say, oh, look, they've all failed. Maybe what you're also asking, we've only had maybe two cases where 
it's not a clear phenotype. So some of the mutants fail, some don't. So in answer, I, we, we, we trust it quite a bit. So be beautiful story indeed. Thank you. Uh, uh, I would have one uh, practical question uh, uh, also from my experience. How do, you, how do you control the influence of maternally deposited uh, mRNA, uh, because, uh, for example, we experienced in one project that basically we saw something like gastrulation arrest, and when we did uh, uh, electroporation of the siRNA into into zygote, then we basically see much worse uh, phenotype, yeah. Yeah. basically affecting already the cleavage stage. Mm -hmm. Which you're, you're absolutely right. Short answer is we don't. Right, so we're just looking at the homozygous null. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few stories we're following up where we also, we also do microinjections, so we compare the knockdown and the knockout phenotype. Um, uh, sometimes it matches really well, sometimes it doesn't. So the, other, the only thing you can do is design a conditional experiment if you really want to follow up, right? Mm. Yeah. Thanks. Actually, there's, there's, can I have one more minute? Is that okay? Are we on time? Um, there, there's, I forgot to put this slide in the right order. There's another observation that I'm pretty interested about that I'd love your input as well. Um, so these are all natural plugs that we're dealing with, right? so no hormones. And there's a few different ways we now have a lot of data to look at this. And one thing that jumped out at me as interesting is the pregnancy rate. And so here's a graph showing two different time points, 3.5 and 7.5, and the pregnancy rate. This is just a small subset of our litters, 300 or so in each. And so at day three and a half, if you get a plug, you're 87% of the time going to find embryos. At day seven and a half, you're only going to find embryos 76 percent of the time. So that's a pretty significant difference, right? So 11 percent change, which means female mice are ovulating, they're fertilizing, and then the whole litter is failing to implant, right? And so we're pretty excited that this as a possible model for human implantation failure, which we believe is sort of the largest embryo failure that happens, right? And we're trying to devise clever ways to get to, to try and use this as a model for that. The other observation we've made is with these extra embryos that I mentioned in that pre-implantation litter. So if we look at our own breeding results, all the way on the right of this other graph, P21, weanlings, I think we're right in line with, I think, what you all find, around seven pups per litter. If we look backwards in time, the number of embryos we get, 7.5, 3.5, 0.5. So just look at the blue line. You can see there's this pretty significant attrition. So if I collect zygotes, I'll see about 10 fertilizations. If I collect three and a half, there's only about eight blastocysts. And these are all now wild type by hat crosses, so take out the null issue. If I look at seven and a half, we've now lost another embryo on the way. And that's what the orange line is indicating, the including the empty decidua. Right? So that's a really hefty attrition. It's 30%. And so to me, that's a pretty interesting biological question also. Like, why is this happening? And so I'm thinking about trying to get some data on other backgrounds to see if that's happening. I'm guessing, like CD1, it's not happening because they're so robust, but we don't really know. And again, I'm just thinking about this as an uh, interesting normal development question. And if you all have insights or ideas about how to try and uh, get at this question, uh, I'd love to hear it as well. So yeah, Rob. Jesse, on that last point, it would be really interesting to redo a chunk of this study with F1s to see if it's just loss of vigor. Sure, sure. So I had two quick questions for you. One is, have you ever tried a mitochondrial translation inhibitor uh, to see if you can recapitulate those uh, mitochondrial ribosome knockout Th That's phenotypes? a great idea. Uh, we thought about that, but the, the hard part is how. So how do you deliver it to the embryos at the right time? You so can't just th you can't throw the drug on and earlier. So so okay. you can you can only culture embryos for so long, and um, depending who you ask, if they're normal during development or not, even without a drug, is questionable. Um, so yeah, we could try and culture five and a halfs for a day with an inhibitor. Um, yeah, we can do things like that. It might be and, tough. And I was also curious about the, the structures that you showed, the mitochondrial structures. Have you been able to identify the molecular composition of those? Um, not yet. It's, not, it's clearly not my area of expertise, and we're, we're hoping you want to do it. We're hoping to find someone who can do it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. I think I've used up my time.